I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. James. It's wonderful to be back with you this morning. I, you don't know how I've missed you so much. It's been, uh, it's been a good two years, but a years uh, filled with uh, a lot of, of you missing in my heart. And thank you again for your prayers and your continued support. It means so much to both uh, myself and my wife, April. So to know we have people back home praying for us always. So around the time I was seven or eight years old, uh, one summer afternoon, my sisters and I were playing over at uh, Grandma's house, at the farmhouse. And after a, a rousing game of croquet, followed up by a, a wonderful, exciting game of hide-and-go-seek, we decided that it would be a good idea to go uh, take a break and enjoy a nice swing on the tire swing so we could have a, a cool breeze in our face. And we decided that the best way to decide who would swing first would be to race over to the swing. And so that's what we did. And uh, I did have a little bit of an unfair advantage. I will admit I was much bigger than my sisters. And so I got there first, and I wanted to swing first. But uh, when they arrived, they decided that that wasn't how it was going to go. Uh, they decided that we should uh, find a different way to, to decide who was going to swing first and then take turns swinging. Well, in the midst of our discussions, uh, somehow we got into a little bit of a shoving match, and then all of a sudden, uh, before I knew it, one of my sisters ended up on the ground, and before I could turn to the adults who were off in the distance watching over our activities and say, I didn't do it, <laughs> one of them came running over, picked my sister up, handed her the swing, and looked in my eyes and said, Selden, you're, you're being a bad big brother. And you can imagine my eight-year-old mind didn't really know how to take that, that moment. I didn't know why I was getting in trouble. I didn't know uh, why they were mad at me. We were all pushing and shoving, and, and sh it was just an accident that she ended up on the ground. As I ran away, I looked back, trying to hold back tears, and I screamed, I hate my sisters. Of course, I didn't really mean it at the time, but I, I didn't know what I was saying. And luckily for me, Grandma was one of the adults in the background, and she came to my aid with an ice cream cone in hand. She came to comfort me. More in, importantly than her comfort, she came to correct me. She said, Selden, we all know what happened was an accident, but you can't say that you hate people. You can't say bad things to people. It makes the world a bad place. Sure, we've all had moments in our lives growing up where we've done something similar, where we've told somebody we've hated them, or where we've said a bad word to somebody um, only to be corrected by an adult or an elder. It's kind of what the adults are there for, and more importantly, that's uh, what we're called to do as Christians. We're called to correct each other when we stumble. It's part of our baptismal covenant. We're supposed to build each other up in faith. And when we're young, we don't always know what we're saying. We don't know the depth of the things that come out of our mouth sometimes. And so, as a, uh, adults, we have to correct our children a little bit to get them on that straightened path. And that's what my grandma did for me. But the downside to growing up and having more knowledge about the world and, and building strength within ourselves is uh, when we become adults, a lot of the times we say exactly what we mean to say. The things that come out of our mouths are meant to come out on purpose. And sometimes those things can be sad and unfortunate. So sad that it leads to those things like the gospel was talking about, about murder and adultery and theft. So sad that it leads to those headlines on the news about small cities in America where people are picketing and rioting in the streets because of hateful words. So sad uh, and so unfortunate that it leads to headlines about nuclear warfare and threats of nuclear warfare between countries. So sad that it leads to terrorism in other places of the world. So sad that it, it leads to divisions not only among political classes, but social, racial lines, gender lines, and so forth and so on. And I don't know about you, St. James, but that makes me sad. 
makes me sad to see all of that stuff constantly coming up in the news, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of hearing all that hateful rhetoric coming out. I'm tired of all those negative headlines. Why can't our world just be like the psalmist described it as it, uh, this morning, how good it is, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity? How wonderful would that be? We could all live in peace and happiness and harmony. I'm here to tell you this morning we can get to that point. We can get to that world where everybody is happy and it's a good and pleasant place, but I'll be the first to let you know it's going to take work. It's going to take work from you. It's going to take work from me. It's going to take work from our brothers and sisters outside the church walls, but we can get there. God wants us to get to that good and pleasant place. And luckily for us, we have the best how-to book ever written to be our guide, to show us the way into that place. And what's even more lucky is that our lectionary readings for this morning, highlights from that how-to guide, give us a good start. They don't give us all of the answers right away, but they help us get one foot out the door. And so to begin, we'll look at the Old Testament reading. And this morning, that reading picks up Genesis again and that story of Joseph that's been building over the last couple of weeks. And we've been seeing Joseph over the last couple of weeks being mistreated and going through unfortunate circumstances all at the hands of his brothers. Well, Father Ben reminded us that Joseph probably wasn't the easiest little brother to get along with. Nonetheless, he was mistreated because of the hate that his brothers had in their hearts for him. But this morning, the the story turns around, and Joseph doesn't fight back with hate. Instead, he opens his heart to God. He keeps God by his side, and he fights hate with good. He chose to look for good and bad situations. And because of that, my friends, you can do that too. You can look for the good that comes out of bad situations. I'm not suggesting that God lets bad things happen so that good can be found. I don't think that's why bad things happen. But what I am saying is that when bad things do happen, you have to keep God by your side and look for the goodness and the love of God in every situation because I promise you it's there. One side story, we all know bad things happen everywhere. They happen in the streets, they happen in our schools, they happen in church sometimes, and they happen at a place like Virginia Theological Seminary where I go to school. My first year of school, we had the unfortunate uh, event where two people walked past one another and one waved, uh, but the other person didn't give a wave in return. And supposedly one thing led to another, and the person who didn't give that returning wave got accused of being racist. I don't know if the story was true or what happened after that, but I I heard that more events like that occurred in the weeks after, and other people were being accused of racism and being bigots and being homophobic, and it made me sad. How could a seminary have things like that happen at it? But because of the leadership of the seminary, because the seminary chose to keep God at their side and look for the good in the situation, we didn't focus on that bad event. And the goodness that has come out of that event is now the seminary has intercultural competency training required for everybody. We have a series of intercultural dialogues where the whole faculty, staff, and student body can get together and talk in a safe place where we can learn about each other and learn from one another about our past experiences, why we think differently, why we can come up with two different ideas about the same thing, and that's healthy, and that's good, and because of that, we're getting to that good and pleasant place that I think God wants. That's only one example for what the world needs to strive to be. Going back to our lectionary readings, our second reading this morning is from Romans. And we learn from that reading that God is merciful to all. And if you'll remember, the reading is really short. It's only a few lines uh, and really one sentence from the beginning of the chapter and a couple lines at the end. And what's missing in the middle is kind of Paul's long, complicated theology, but it really boils down to this, and that is in 
uh, Jesus, for Paul, there is no Gentile or Jew. And looking at that theology and trying to fit it into what's going on in the world today, that tells me that if there is no Gentile or Jew, that must mean that in Jesus there, there's no black or white. There's no male or female. There's no Republican or Democrat. And as uh, the great Dr. Martin Luther King said in his last Christmas Eve sermon, all of us, all of humanity in Christ Jesus is made one. We are all united together as one. And once we realize that, and once we realize the dignity and the wonderful um, personality of every human being, we're no longer going to be mean to each other. We're no longer going to trample on one another. We're no longer going to exploit one another or kill one another. We're no longer going to have hatred in our hearts for one another because hatred is too much of a burden to bear. It's too hard for us to go around walking in our daily lives carrying hate in our heart because if you have hate in your heart that takes up space that's meant for God. Your heart needs to be committed to God. That's where our Gospel reading begins to tie in this morning. And our Gospel is actually two stories, but the first story is about those things that defile. Jesus tells His disciples that it's not what um, goes into the mouth that is defiling, it's what comes out of the mouth. And on a surface level, that seems to fit really great with what we've talked about this morning. It fits right in with that story when I was younger, when I said I hated my sisters. That was a defiling moment for me. But it's really deeper than that. Jesus isn't just trying to tell the disciples to watch out for what they say. He's trying to get them to think a little bit more. He's trying to get them to recognize that what's really important is the inner commitments of the heart. Because when your heart's committed on the right things, the things that we say and the things that we speak in our actions reflect what our heart is committed on. If our heart is committed on God and God is love, then our actions will reflect that. We'll go out into the streets and love our neighbor as ourselves. If our heart isn't committed on God or our heart has hate in it, that's when we do the things and say the things that defile. The second half of our gospel lesson for this morning is about the Canaanite woman. And as you remember, the Canaanite woman comes to Jesus begging for healing, begging for healing for her daughter. Some other scholars, and I'm not a scholar by the way, I still have a lot of learning to do, but other interpreters look at this, the beginning of the story at least, and, and look at it differently than I do. They look at the actions of Jesus and go, oh wow, Jesus was mean. He, he ignored the woman. Why would he ignore someone asking for help? I don't think that Jesus really was ignoring the woman. One, the Greek text doesn't talk about ignoring at all. It just says Jesus didn't answer the woman, just like we heard in our own reading this morning. I think what Jesus was actually doing was trying to test that woman's faith. He was trying to see if, if the inner commitments of her heart were really focused on God and focused on what Jesus had to offer because Jesus knew what he had to offer was good and he was trying to see if the woman was really committed to that. And she was. And this is where everybody agrees it was her persistence in asking Jesus that helped Jesus to realize she was committed. She kept persisting in the faith, and because of that, Jesus told her she was healed. It was her faith that healed her. But the real lesson here is that we must persist in our faith. Persistence is key. Our faith is one of those funny things where we're going to go up and down in it. We'll have highs and lows. We'll have revelations, and we'll have doubts. And believe me, that's okay. Doubts are okay in faith because I think there's anything that's antithetical to faith at all. It's certainty. Doubts allow us to grow our relationship with God, but the one thing that needs to be consistent in our faith is our persistence in trying to maintain it, trying to keep that relationship with God, and that's part of what we do as baptized members of Christ, too. We're called to continue to build that relationship with Christ, even when the bad stuff happens, because I promise you, if you keep persisting in your faith, good things are going to come of it, and the world needs good things right now. Last week, if 
Father Ben reminded us and told us that all the eyes of the world are focused right on the United States and the tragic events of Charlottesville. And he's right. They're focused on us because they want to see how we're going to react, what we're going to do, because unfortunately other things like that are happening around the world right now. They're not necessarily related, but the people want to know what we're going to do. I can promise you right now that if we don't show that we're committed to God, that if our answer doesn't have God in it, we're not going to give the world the answer that they need. We're not going to give them the reaction that they need. The world doesn't need any more politicians to tell us how things work. They don't need any more alt-right or alt-left people. They need a different kind of people. They need people like you, people who are alt-God. People who can go out into the world and be an example for what it's like to stay committed to your faith. People who can go out into the world and show them what it's like to love and respect the dignity of every human being like that baptismal covenant asks us to do. People who can go out into the world and look for the goodness and the love of God in every single situation, regardless of it's bad or good. So don't be afraid to be that alt-God person, my friends. Go out into the world when we leave this place. Go to your friends and your families and your neighbors and tell them what you know about God. Tell them what you've heard here, not necessarily from me, but just tell them from your heart. Because I know you're committed to God and God's love and goodness and sh shines through you. So go be that person. And when the bad things do happen, stay committed to your faith. Persist in building your relationship with God because I promise you that God is good and that God is love and that God really wants this world to get to that good and pleasant place where all of us can live together as one in peace and harmony and unity. We all just have to help God get there. Amen.